going to actually pay attention to the time. Not that anyone cares, but, you know, history is forever. Um, talk about history. And the reason I'm doing it this way is because, you know, when we come to open historical map, we're mappers. We're kind of interested in history, but we haven't been trained in it. And so there are lessons people don't know. There are a lot of people in the world, you can see them in social media, who believe that history is what they were taught in high school and it never changes and it's always the same. People with training in history know better. Information starts being lost as soon as something happens. Records are not kept. Memory is unreliable. Records are destroyed. When Richmond burned in 1865, to mention where we are right now, many of the records of the state of Virginia were destroyed. And actually, Sherman didn't burn Richmond. The Confederates did on their way out of town. Just, you know, if you've ever talked to a Southerner, Sherman burned everything. Uh, some people deliberately choose to misremember. In the history of Civil War memoirs, and there was a lot of that going on about 10 to 15 years after the war, a lot of participants waited until the other guy was dead to write about the battle they were in so that they could blame the other guy, the one who died. There's a lot of that going on. And then, of course, there's always the issue of if you don't like the narrative, rewrite it. And so, again, reaching back to the Civil War, because we're in Richmond, um, immediately after the war ended, a set of, and this is the actual definition of unreconstructed Confederate, a bunch of Confederates decided to rewrite the story of the Civil War in order to make Robert E. Lee into a great saint and Grant into a butcher. And that's not what really happened, but they convinced a lot of people of that. So history is challenging. So I'll talk about some map things because it's a mapping conference and we should talk about maps. This is a map from about 1700 of the West Coast. You will discover that in maps produced of the West Coast from about 1600 to the end of the 1700s, they consistently showed a large inland sea called the Mare de, de West, the Sea of the West. That's 200 years of maps showing an inland sea that did not exist. Um, it turns out that an explorer in 1602 was sailing up the uh, West Coast and he saw the mouth of a river, and I'm not sure what river it was. It might have actually been Puget Sound, and he assumed it was access to an inland sea. And so magically, this thing appeared on all the maps that stuck for 200 years because explorers were hearing rumors there was one. Natives were telling them that there was one, and so they believed it. And it wasn't until colonial settlement that they finally figured out it was a utter fantasy. And this sort of gets into well-open historical map isn't open cartographic fantasy map or open historical fantasy map. We're trying to deal in real facts. So this is why you can't just jump on any map you find and say, cool, I'm going to copy it into open historical map because it's out of copyright because it may be full of it. And so this is an example map. I'm from upstate New York, just outside of Albany, and I've done a lot of historical mapping in Albany. This is the Miller map of 1695. And this is a really easy map to find online. Many copies were made of it. They're all pretty similar. Doesn't matter much the difference between them. And I went and decided that I can align this on the modern map of Albany using Map Warper, which is one of the tools available for this. And while Yunker Street and Handler Street don't have those names anymore, they happen to be State Street and Broadway. And I know where those are. So I found three reference points and I flopped it onto uh, OpenStreetMap and I got this. And so the English fort near the top of State Street is missed off a little bit, but Pearl Street, State Street are about right. A little hard to see in this presentation. Broadway is kind of in the wrong place. So you kind of got to look at that and say, hum. And so this is one of the key points, is that anywhere, and Jeff was getting at this in his presentation, you've got local historians and you've got local hysterical societies, 
there are people who know this material who aren't part of the mapping community. And if you're going to do open historical map, you should be reaching out to them. Because I showed this to my friend, Don Rittner, who is a prominent local historian in Albany. And he said, well, yeah, the Miller map has issues. And it's like, okay, there's backstory to the Miller map. It turns out that Miller took all the notes on this map and then he got on a ship to sail back to England. And this was one, during one of the periodic tiffs between the British and the French. You know, they had a lot of those. And so the ship he was on was captured by the French. It was the Nine Years' War. He threw all his notes overboard and then drew this map back in England from memory. And Don told me, well, look at some of the later maps. They're better. So I then got to this, which is the Romer map. And it's basically, again, it shows the first stockade. It shows the fort at the top of the hill. And it shows roughly the same pattern of streets. And I don't have this one overlaid because it just basically doesn't show up well. But when I aligned it, I had this real dawning realization. Because one of the things you see on these maps is you see that State Street, vert, North, excuse me, vertical and Broadway at the bottom horizontal look really wide. And they were really wide. And they're narrower than that today if you're just looking at um, curb to curb. But what I found out when I overlaid it in Map Warper was, and it caused a realization, you think they had sidewalks in colonial New York in 1700. <laughs> That's right, there are no sidewalks. So the boundaries of Broadway match up with the building fire facades today. Because over the course of 300 years, you would tear a building down, you would build a new building, and you would make the facade line up in the same place. And so if you're looking to verify that you've worked a map correctly, look at the building facades. Don't look at the street. Street curbs move. So again, this is a message. Reach out to historians, archaeologists, mappers. Their interests aren't the same as yours, but they can inform your effort. You can learn things you need to know. Now we're going to talk about Fort Orange. Fort Orange was the original Dutch fort. Well, it was the second Dutch fortification in Albany. Because the first one was on an island that was flood prone and it lasted like two years. Fort Orange was the one that lasted a little longer before the British came along and um, evicted the Dutch. Except they didn't really evict them. They let the Dutch settlers stay. And the Dutch settlers kind of anglicized and they're still there. Um, the site of Fort Orange is not accessible at the present time because uh, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a lot of federal highway money for building interstates. So Albany built one. But before they built Interstate 787, an archaeologist ran a dig and they explored the Fort Orange site. So... He led the dig. I reached out to him and he sent me a PDF of his uh, report. He's retired now, but he's held, held on to copies of his work. And I was able to place Fort Orange in OHM according to his map. The information is almost certainly in the New York State Archives and the State Education Department because he worked for the State Education Department when he did the dig. And those people never throw anyone or anything away. You may not be able to find it, but they have it. And there's a lot of other archaeology that's been in, done in Albany for these periods of Dutch and English rule. I mean, they've done a lot of things like go down into the basements of buildings in the downtown and go looking for remnants of the wooden stockade. And they found it. So none of this stuff is actually magic. The details are there. You just need to find the right group of people to talk to. So Fort Orange... This is overlaid on modern open street map. Fort Orange is right there. And yeah, you see the interstate, the ramps, and you see the CSX railway tracks right over the top. So nobody is going to get to it, but at least we know where it is. And that's the way a lot of stuff is because, you know, there was an awful lot of federal money for building highways in the 60s and 70s, and by God, they built them. 
Um, some of the original locks of the Erie Canal were underneath an exit on the same interstate further up the river. They excavated those before they buried them under the highway. So all of this stuff is around. Then we're going to talk about um, Lake George, which is a fairly large lake further north in the Hudson River Lake Champlain corridor. And because I do a lot of historical things in the Hudson Valley of New York, I've become very attuned to the fact that the French and the British spent 100 years dueling for control over North America in this corridor. The 100 years war period in Europe, and there were four things called French and Indian Wars, and they matched up with four wars between the British and the French in Europe. Now, French and the British obviously didn't get along terribly well in that period. So um, during the French and Indian War, which was the last of the plural French and Indian Wars, there was a Battle of Lake George. There was Fort George and Fort William Henry. The two forts are gone. They were wooden, and wooden forts do not survive. Um, there's a wooden replica of Fort William Henry tourist trap today. Um, and something you run into is changing landforms. And so these are some period maps. And they're going to be hard to see from back where you are, but they basically show the area where the battles were fought and then where the forts were built. And... The question is, when you get a period map, is always going to be how good is it? And I've already showed you the Miller map and the Romer map and shown you that the Miller map kind of has issues and the Romer map is pretty good. You're going to see that with these maps, too. And I only recently learned about this work. There's a volunteer guide at the Lake George Battlefield Park named Mark Silo who decided he wanted to match the maps to the topography and figure out where all this stuff really was. So he did it by footwork. He's a volunteer guide. He's on the site. He has incentives to just go walk around in the woods and look at stuff. Um, he also then looked at older maps looking for confirmation, whereas I, as a mapper, am more likely to go to the older maps first. I provided a link here, um, which is, of course, very long, so you're going to have a lot of trouble typing it in. But if you know you take a photograph and go to it, he, he provided a really nice document describing all of his detective work, and he learned things. Oh, no, this is the next thing. So the uh, lesson that he learned was that when you're looking at maps of the period, like these, surprisingly often the map makers would adjust the proportions to make it fit the page nicely. And so the vertical proportions and the horizontal proportions may not match. And this can make alignment challenging, um, especially if you don't know it, but what Map Warper can to some degree adjust for this. And I use Map Warper in that manner a bit. The other thing he figured out was that at least one of these ridges, and you see there's a couple of ridges up here running up to the lake, at least one of these ridges had been shaved. Um, somebody basically took the top off of one of them and used it as fill in order to build a flat area so that the Adirondack Preserve in New York State has a tiki lodge. Now, why you would put a tiki lodge in upstate New York in the Adirondacks, of course, escapes me. I've never heard a coherent explanation for it, but there is one. And that's the reason why people are confused by these maps and aren't quite sure how to line them up because the whole hill is missing. So, you know, it's stuff happens. You know, went the wrong way. So our final example here, maps of the Antietam battlefield, which I know is not in upstate New York, it's in Western Maryland. But I've done some work with that because um, I have some family history tied to that battle. Um, there's a set of maps called the Cope maps. They were made in 1900. They were surveyed by the Army Corps of Engineers. And the Army Corps of Engineers in 1900 is going to be very precise. These were basically West Pointers who were trained in civil engineering. 
Um, and it has troop locations supplied by Ezra Carmen, who was a veteran officer of the battle. And those are actually very precise because Carmen was a pretty unrelenting researcher. And so here's a snippet from one, and this is showing a particular part of the battlefield. And so he's drawn on the roads, the fences, the uh, land use symbols will tell you whether or not it was trees or it was pasture. And it'll tell you if stuff is corn or, or something else was planted there during the battle. It's actually a spectacular map. I love these, and because of the precision, they align perfectly when you geo-reference. But then there's another map, the Elliott Burial Map. Elliott's famous for his Gettysburg map of the burials there. And about two, three years ago, the New York Public Library was doing an inventory on their collection, and they discovered that they had a copy of the Antietam burial map that Elliot made that everyone had forgotten, including the library who had a copy. So apparently it looks to me like it's annotations Elliot made on an existing map, and the existing map looks precise, but it's not. So this is the Elliott map, and you see, you know, it's got landform stuff drawn in where the woods were, and the woods are an important feature of Antietam. It shows you where the Union and the Confederates were buried. It shows you where the horses were buried, the little commas on their side. Um, these were temporary burials over the course of a few years after the Civil War. These were excavated. The bodies were reinterred at other cemeteries. And when I went to align it, I couldn't make it align. And then I stood back, you know, take the 50,000 foot view and realized that, no, the angles on the roads are all the same. This is out of proportion. It's not a thing I will ever precisely align in map warper as a whole. So the solution I got was align local sections and just walk over the battlefield piecewise. Because I'm never going to get this map to fully align. And so that's, I think, the last slide, and I'm ready for questions.